It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Professor Thomas Allen Jukes, M.S., and Dan Joseph Calvin. The professor, and this is not the one from Gilligan's Island, the professor teaches in the Cyber Operations Program at the University of Arizona College of Applied Science and Technology, which goes by CAST, one of only 13 undergraduate programs accredited by the National Security Agency, NSA, home to America's code makers and code breakers. Tom started his cyber company in August of 2018 called CyberEye to look out for small and medium-sized businesses. He's worked in the industry for 17 years as a cybersecurity analyst before becoming uh, a profession. College of Applied Science and Technology has national recognition for several of their programs. The NSA designated their Bachelor of Science in Cyber Operations program as a Center of Academic Excellence in Cyber Operations, and the Defense Intelligence Agency designated their Bachelors of Applied Science program in Intelligence Studies as an Intelligence Community Center of Academic Excellence. These programs are emblematic of their focus on quality degrees that combine academic academic rigor with specialized instruction designed to prepare students for employment in high demand career fields. CAS provides opportunities for students to earn high quality and meaningful U of A degrees online and has sites throughout Southern Arizona, including key border communities. And to his left is Dan Joseph Galvin, who's also a security expert. Um, they're both down uh, just south of me and um, Sierra Vista, which is what would you say about a three hour drive south of of uh, Phoenix, and every dentist on earth is gone there because the most famous dentist in the whole world, Doc Holliday, uh, that's where the shootout corral. We should have filmed this on location at Doc <laughs> Holliday's uh, uh, tomb. Uh, are you guys big uh, Doc Holliday? Um, Dan Galvin, PMP, CISSP, CASP, is a cybersecurity expert working with Professor at CyberEye, always watching, providing low cost cybersecurity solutions to small and medium sized businesses. They provide a superior solution for healthcare and dentist providers to help keep them HIPAA compliance. Their cyber solutions are critical for any professional business that has to protect their reputation and their clients. CyberEye monitoring solution alerts of a anomalies on users' devices and networks so hackers can be stopped in their tracks. They offer cyber training, and I hope they do an online CE course on Dental Town on this someday. It'd be so great. Cloud backup and recovery, incidents response, forensics, risk assessments, and cyber insurance. The solution is a great fit for dentists who can't afford to hire a cybersecurity professional. The service is not required for those that do not use email or a browser. For all the rest of us, CyberEye is a trusted advisor for cybersecurity needs, and you can learn more at CyberEyeAW.com. Um, AW, does that stand for always watching? That's correct. All yeah. right. See, I'm not as dumb as I look. Learn <laughs> more at CyberEyeAW.com. AW.com. Dan is a uh, has a master of computer engineering and several industry cyber certifications. He spent over 25 years of experience software telecommunication industry, and he has the honor of being the first cyber guy from CyberEye. Gentlemen, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the show. And the professor, I know you got a hell of a lot bigger and better things to do than be talking to a bunch of dentists all day. But um, why did you start CyberEye? I mean, you could have gone to the NSA. You could have gone. You, you could have gone anywhere. Why? 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 Why CyberEye? Well, um, that's a great question, Herc. I When I finished my master's degree in cybersecurity uh, in 2017, I started teaching at the University of Arizona in the cyber operations program that you mentioned. And uh, I, as I was researching uh, different security vendors, um, they contacted me because they saw the. Arizona.edu email, and they thought, oh, perfect. We're going to be able to get into the University of Arizona and sell our products. And then, you know, I'd call them and they'd find out I was just a lowly professor and I made no business decisions for the university. And, you know, and then they were all disappointed. And, uh, but that was an opportunity for me to interview them and ask them, um, who, what's your target market? Who do you serve? And the response was always the government big businesses and big universities. Those, those are the customers that we're looking for. And so then I'd ask them, well, what about small businesses? 
And the response was, oh, oh uh, small businesses don't have the budget to afford our product. And it, and it just continued vendor after vendor after vendor. They were all like that. And I thought, okay, well, well, if nobody's going to do small businesses, I guess it's up to me. And so I took the, my years of experience and put together a package that, that could protect small businesses like dentists and was affordable, could fit in their budget. That was really a key, protect them and make it affordable. So how come your marketing slogan isn't uh, to dentists that uh, I'm your Huckleberry? <laughs> <laughs> are you are you the are you the Huckleberry for all the dentists? <laughs> I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> Huckleberry Tom. Well, you know what? Um, I I tell you, um, you know, like when I was in dental school, um, I never used a computer. I never saw a computer. I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have any of this stuff. And, um, my gosh, now it's just, it's just, everything's digital. I cannot believe it. And they're, they're saying your car has the equivalent to several computers in, in, in a damn car. And, and um, and what, what's sad is the, my, uh, my homies, you know, we, we didn't go to school eight years to learn how to program and do cybersecurity and all that stuff. We, we want to get you out of pain and fix your tooth. And some of these guys, like, uh, they look up to their state dental society and they say, hey, what do we need to do? And they, like, would endorse a cybersecurity company. And then that one got hacked in or, you know, this or that and everything. And now when I talk to associations and people in dentistry, they're just like, yeah, we, we don't want to get into recommending this stuff because – you're not McDonald's competing against Burger King. Um, these cryptocurrency things that I've been reading about, you know, when people say, oh, they're, they're, um, you know, they're, they're decentralized and they're on the web. And I hear intelligence agencies saying, no, they're actually all in China, Russia, North Korea. And um, so you're not compete. You're not McDonald's competing against Burger King. You're competing against Russia, China, North Korea, everybody that hates America. Um, except for me, I, I hate America too, but I uh, actually um, don't program. Uh, that's a joke. Uh, but um, so this is a high risk business, even for you. Uh, mm-hmm. what, what, what do you, what do you think about all that? You know, that's a, um, it's an interesting point that you take there. Um, I often tell my students that given enough time and opportunity and resources, any attack will be successful. That's just the bottom of the. Okay, say that again. I'm so given enough time and resources. Given enough time, opportunity, and resources, any attack will be successful. Yeah. So that's so that's so, why. Oh, go ahead, Dan. Oh, okay. So I was just going to add there. So the whole idea behind cybersecurity is to to make yourself a harder target than everybody else out there. And that's what uh, CyberEyes is working on, right? So it's not just the technical. You got to take care of the people. Uh, you know, let me say it now. The user training is a big deal of it. We, we call it defense in depth, right? So you have the technical aspects, uh, but you also have policy aspects. You know, do you do, you do job rotations? Do, uh, do you do user training and things like that and physical access? And Tom and I were just talking about that. Um, physical access if somebody can get into your your office and get a hold of your computer the whatever it doesn't matter what you have on that computer they can they can break into it it is it it's a big deal so it's 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 the whole thing all three of them are, are important if the you for the user training uh you can have you know this thing locked up tight but if you give the keys to that employee that loves to click on everything, he can give the, the keys right away to, uh, to the hacker, regardless of what, you, what you're doing. So they have the people, the people part of it, I think is critical. So the professor, and by the way, professor, I just need to know personally, um, did you want Ginger or Marianne when you watched? <laughs> <laughs> when I was when I when Gilligan's Island was on TV as a little kid, I was more interested in what the professor was doing than Ginger <laughs> or Marianne. Yeah. Well, I was interested in Marianne, so I'm out of luck because Ginger is the only remaining living person from that island. They're all passed away. But you um you posted on uh the professor posted on Dental Town um 
his deal is that Thomas Cyber Eye always watching. It says um, the crooks have changed their tactics as more and more of us got better at backing up our files. Fewer and fewer of us paid the ransom. Therefore, we cut into their profits. That's bad for their business. Before, they just stole your access to the files by encrypting them. Now they actually steal copies of the file if you don't pay up, and and often even if you do, they will dump your files on the dark web and monetize your data further. Files like your QuickBooks or the scans of your birth certificate, social security, driver's license. It's not uncommon, nor is it recommended for people to keep spreadsheets of all their bank and investment account numbers. I, I need to ask a selfish question just for myself right now. Um, my, um, I have the, uh, the Chase app on my phone, that my Chase bank and my dental office is in the same parking lot as Chase, and I have everything on my Chase app bank account, and I'm so damn dumb, I don't even know, when, when you're talking about all this hacking, are they actually hacking into my iPhone too? And do you think, my my bookkeeper and my accountant say, please don't do that, will you please delete that app, will you quit being an idiot? And I'm like, what's your what's the professor's response? The The industry best practice is, if you don't need the software on your phone or your computer, uninstall it. Too many people have a habit of going to the app store and downloading the latest app that they read about on Reddit or on Facebook, and, and they try it out, and then they leave it there, right? It, um, the, way, the way computers are compromised generally is because you have some software with a vulnerability, a bug that can be exploited. And all software has bugs. All software has vulnerabilities. Um, many of the vulnerabilities simply have not yet been discovered. They're there. It's like it's like a window on a building hidden behind a bush. You know, all a burglar's got to do is go behind the bush and go, oh, there's a window and it's blocked from view. I'll go in that window tonight. So I, I, I and I need to know the truth. Did my comptroller, Stacy, did she pay you to say that or send you a case of beer? <laughs> Is this, are you guys doing, are you guys plotting against me? I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> so um, my oldest son, Eric, um, he showed me his laptop and there was an image on the screen and it was, a, um, I don't know what you, uh, in that quote, is, is that when you say attack, do you, is it always a cyber attack given enough time, opportunity, resource, any cyber attack will be successful? Is cyber attack the whole IT go-to term? Pretty much, yes. Okay, and um, and they wanted um, Bitcoin, and I said, no, we're gonna take that out in the driveway, and we're gonna beat it up with a sledgehammer and throw it away, and just go to Best Buy and start over. Um, so, but um, are they doing that to phones now? I mean, could I like turn on my iPhone one day, and and they got the iPhone, or they got the data, or? It, it's not a big enough market it, for that one. Right, right. I, iPhones are quite secure. They're not impenetrable, but they are quite secure. The, the biggest market for ransomware, which is what you just described, is the Windows operating system. And, and small, medium-sized businesses, right? So the, uh, the large businesses and the governments and all the people that, all the companies that, uh, the vendors that Tom was talking about earlier were looking for, they have the protection Right, but normally you're a dentist. You know how to look at people's mouths and, and fill a cavity, but uh, you don't. What do you know about cybersecurity? Right, well, and that's and, and the and the the hackers, the the criminals are out there. The cyber criminals are out there. They know where the weak points are. But but you have three things that the hackers love, right? Protected health information, PHI. Prote uh, personally identifiable information, PII, and uh, personal credit card industry, so p credit card information. So you okay, have to I'm try slow. I'm slow. So personal health information. What was the second yep. one? Personal PII, pers personally identifiable information is protected health information, is PHI. And PCI is credit card information. Yeah, it's the credit card industry standard. So uh, – a dentist office will have all three. So it's a huge target because all each of those is worth money on the, on the dark web. So if they pull the ransomware off, they're going to number one, hopefully get, 
get money from you, and then they're still going to take your data and then sell it on the web. And the PHI, protected health information, is worth way more than your credit card, mm-hmm. right? Your ca- credit card information is is good for about a week. So it's it's a buck. Your credit card uh, information is only good for about a week? Yeah, and then people terminate the credit card and, and get a new number. So, you know, until it happens. So that, okay, that information is... is uh, it's perishable. That's the word I was looking for. Perishable. Okay, so it's um so just to say I got that right, personal health information, PHI, personal identifiable information, PII, and personal credit information, PCI. And you're saying dentists are most vulnerable because we have the patient's personal health information? You have all three. Right. So you have all three. Right. You're trifecta. They love you. PHI is all of the all of the uh, medical record stuff, your your medical history and everything. PII, that's your driver's license, your social security number, your address, your birthday, your phone number, yeah. yeah, all of that personal birthday, information, yeah. yeah, and then PCI, that's the credit card, right? So wow. you have wow. all you have all three, Howard, and and uh, but uh, the one they love the most is is the the health information because versus your if you have a thousand uh, credit cards, that's worth five bucks a piece, you know, five grand. But if you have a thousand health records, that's uh, five hundred thousand. You know, I, I want to ask a. Um, I don't like to ever talk about pol- politics, religion, sex, violence, things like that. But one of the things I've noticed from lecturing around the world is I. I, I think it's completely normal to always think the country you were born in has the best food and wine and music and everything. And, and, and the further you get away from someone that must be the bad guy. And a lot of Americans, um, you know, they always, the, all the other countries are doing everything wrong. And then when I went and lectured at all these 50 other countries, they assured me what my country was doing wrong. <laughs> and right now, whenever they talk about all these cyber attacks and hackers, it's always Russia and China and North Korea, which just happened to be, our top time competitors, but does do you think a lot of those guys live amongst the three hundred and twenty two million Americans? Do you think a lot of this cyber crime? Do you think there's someone in Arizona? I mean, probably not Phoenix, but definitely in Sierra Vista where you guys are. Uh, do you do you think there's actually a lot of that's coming from within the country? Hmm. You know, we're not seeing a lot of that. I mean, honestly, what we are seeing is. Um, uh, it, it literally Russia, China, um, North Korea. I mean, North Korea is a great example because they don't have uh, uh, na- natural resources and they're under sanctions, so they don't get government assistance. Uh, North Korea funds a lot of the, the North Korean government funds a lot of their government agencies through ransomware. So, so most of this, you would say, is state-sponsored. Cyber terrorism. It's, yes, it's a combination: state-sponsored, uh, uh, yeah. organized, crime. organized crime. So the one of the biggest crime syndicates in the world is the Russian cyber uh, organization. Uh, but they only to be, you know, put up against like China and North Korea. Well, you Iran. know, when I when I lectured in Russia, you know, that's what I love about dentists because it doesn't matter where you're from or I'm from or religion or anything. When we get together, we're dentists. You know, we have that instant bondability and I, I just love it. Every country I've gone to, it's been that way. And the Russians, when I lectured in Russian, you know what the Russians told me? I said, well, what's the main difference between an American and a Russian? And he said, well, and if you were um, the smartest guy in the class in America, you'd probably... Uh, like your sign, what what do you it says? Innovation distinguishes between leaders and, or what does it say? Your a a beautiful bald head. Between a leader, innovation <laughs> distinguishes between a leader, um, between a leader and and a follower. And he says, if you were the smartest guy in the class in America, you would start a business. If you were, uh, I mean, like that, you might start a bank. He says, if you were the smartest guy in Russia, you'd try to break into a bank. <laughs> and and these are Russian dentists telling me this at a bar where we're frolicking and and having fun, and they they were the first first to admit it. Man, it's something weird about the culture. Um, the smartest, he said, the smartest people in Russia. Um, it, it's the challenge that they, they they'd rather steal the money out of your bank 
then start their own damn bank. So some of this might be a, a cultural thing. Um, I want to I want to ask the professor a uh, uh, question that someone asked him on message on Dental Town. Um, the professor says uh, many experts encourage offsite backups in order to avoid the necessity of paying the ransom. That approach is no longer valid. And then Newleaf says I'm not fully understanding why that is not valid. What so what so what are the experts currently recommending? Uh, pretty much anywhere you look, you're going to see um, when a question is asked, how do I protect myself against ransomware? Almost exclusively, the answer is back up your data and back it up off site. Uh, and that used to be true uh, when when ransomware was like ransomware 1.0. Um, all, all the ransomware did was essentially password protect all of your files and then you'd pay the Bitcoin to get the password. To, to open your files back up. But uh, ransomware 2.0 or the newer ransomware versions, they actually copy your data off the network first. Then they password protect your files. As Dan was saying earlier, if you then don't pay the Bitcoin, and even if you do, they're going to dump your data onto the dark web and sell it. So um, that's why... Uh, uh, an offsite backup is not a solution for ransomware. Yeah, it's not a not a solution, but it's better than the on-site backups. So if you if you have an on-site backup, normally what happens is people will will plug it into the the network, uh, and after everybody's gone for the day, then the backup will happen, and it could take a couple hours, or if it's a a longer one, it could take six hours. So they, they keep it plugged in and, and forget about it. Well, the problem with doing an on-site backup is, number one, you forget about it, like I said. And if you ever get a ransomware attack, the first thing the ransomware does is look around the network for shared drives. And that shared drive has your backup on it. So if 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 you have that backup on there, it is a pile of ashes in the morning and encrypted just like the rest of it. So if you have a cloud backup, then at least you you do have a, a valid backup still. Okay, so that that was gonna be sorry to interrupt. That that was gonna be my next question. Moving forward, it doesn't matter that today's you know March in twenty twenty one. What matters is um going forward. It, are all these dentists just going to move their practice management software to somebody else in the cloud and just have dummy terminals so that they can compete against Russia or is, um, or, or long live the PC. Cause I noticed, I noticed with Americans, like, um, you, you go to many, many countries and they're all like, um, yeah, we want community subways and community. Everything's community. But America's like, I want my own ranch, my own horse, my own cow, <laughs> make my own butter. Americans are fiercely independent people. And when you start saying, um, put stuff on the cloud, I know my homies, half of them are like, no, it's going to be in my ranch, my dental fiefdom. So, and what is better? Because this, um, they, this is asked on Dental Town. Um, regarding cybersecurity, she's opening up her first office just Will you coach her for the basics? Because that's going to be a big question. Would you recommend um, some software on the cloud like Curve? Would you, you know, so so just just tell someone she's 25. She just got out of AT Still in Mesa or Midwestern Dental School in Glendale. What would you tell her for her newborn baby dental office? What to do? The unfortunately, the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the reason why it depends is. Um, let's talk about cloud for just a second. The online EMR, electronic medical records. Um, the definition of a cloud service is that it's somebody else's computer. It's somebody else's computing resources that you don't control. You don't control their security. You don't control the implementation. Um, uh, uh, one of my clients a couple of days ago, here's an example. Um, they said they were working with a vendor and um, they couldn't get some software to work. It required a username and password. And the vendor over the phone said, well, the password I have for this user is, and then he recited the password, and that was the password. So the problem is that, that the vendor was storing the password in their database in clear text, meaning if it's retrievable by that vendor, it's retrievable by anybody. 
So that's an example of, of, of the lack of security you know, that vendors implement. So you don't control that. So a couple things. So the, I just read a report uh, last month where one out of every two of these vendors has been hacked. Right, so just because they're hacked, in, and I, I start the, you know, in in Turkey, if you get into a taxi, and and you're driving around, and the taxi cab driver has an accident, guess who's responsible for for uh, fixing everything? You are, because not the, not the, taxi, not driver. the taxi driver. You hired the taxi. So when you're talking about the cloud and your responsibility, even though you push your your uh, client's medical records into the cloud, into these EMRs, uh, you're still responsible for that information, and that's that is you're legally responsible. So since well, my, you're legally my, uh, yeah. on my computer, it says I need uh, for the password I need eight characters. So my password is uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> <laughs> That's that, good. That's nice and long. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good password. <laughs> that's a good thanks password. For tell, thanks for telling the world. <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> the, the, another question we're, I have selfishly, an, another question I have selfishly is um, I've seen apps that will manage all your passwords on all your stuff. And is that a good idea or is that an even worse idea? It, it well it depends on who you ask. Yeah, since you're asking me, I'll tell you. I think that's a good idea, and here's why. Um, the, the one of the biggest problems that that we have in security is shared passwords. You need to think of a password like dental floss, since we're using the theme of dentistry. <laughs> Treat your passwords like dental floss. Make them long, and don't share them with anybody. Nice. So, I am. Um, I actually um, posted that article. Uh, yesterday on uh, Dental Town, um, oh, uh, I did. Article? What's that? Was it my article you posted? Uh, I, I think Dan Dan wrote that one. Oh, Dan, so Dan wrote like that one. Flush, Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah, well, so, yeah, yeah, Dan, you were the author. Um, yeah. The the um this. Let me uh, see where I posted that. Um, um yeah, in my blog. Yeah, and in the cyber um, blog. Yeah. So um, I'll put passwords, and um. Yeah, it said it said we have been hacked. What's next? And I posted that article, and I thought it was a great article. Uh, it said um, uh, passwords are like dental floss. Flossing is hard. Passwords are the dental floss of the internet. They take precious time to use. Everyone hates them. They cause mild discomfort. Blah blah blah. I mean, it, it just goes <laughs> it goes on and on and on. Uh, but that blog is on their website. Cyber I A W Cyber S C Y B E R I E Y E and A W for always watching. But basically, he says floss passwords are like dental floss. Flossing is hard. Password strength. The longer is better. Don't reuse your floss. Really, um, try it everywhere. Passport managers consider the consequences. And you have another one: the saga of the stolen stingray. Um, you know, imagine one day I own a 1970 Corvette Stingray. It will it will have its own garage. I'll lock the garage doors so I'm not using it to make sure it's safe. I'll put an alarm on the building to be sure, and I won't leave the keys in it. And you know, um, but yeah, it's um th these are these are troubling times. And and like say um. My homies rely on their state dental societies and one state dental society recommended a company like yours. And then that was a really bad idea. And now I think, I think the dentists are going to be thrown out in the wash because I, I don't think any intelligent, I mean, if the American dental association became in charge of um, dental security, obviously they're no match for the Russians. And then when they all got um, thrown, you know, when, the, when it all went South, they would take the fall for it. So what? What is a uh, what? So so go back to that um that that little girl. She's twenty five. She just opened her office. Tell walk her through the basics. Well, I, I, the first thing I would say is um, you need to consider um, the 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 what do we call that the not the trifecta. Dan said trifecta yeah. earlier, and now trifecta is in my, PCR, it's, a tri it, it's the triad. That's what the cybersecurity <laughs> triad is. CIA. Confidentiality, <laughs> integrity, and availability. I, and those are really ambiguous. That's the CIA? 
CIA, this, we call it the CIA triad. Confidentiality means only those who should see the data can see the data. Integrity means the data should never be changed except in authorized ways by authorized individuals. And availability means that the data should always be available to those to whom it should be available. And then we deny it to everybody else. So, so the, what was the, okay, confidentiality was the CIA, availability was A. What was the I? Integrity, data integrity. So, data integrity. What, right. So, the problem you mentioned Russians breaking into, you know, large, you know, whoever the dental, dental, um, American, De Dental, American Dental Association, whoever they recommend is next the next target of the Russians. Um, an example, there's a, a huge company called SolarWinds. And SolarWinds was a, a large vendor for the government, for big businesses. And back in uh, oh, March of last year, yep. um, their software repository, basically you can think of it as the Amazon for the software that Solar uh, Solar Winds owns was broken into by Russia, and one of those files was Trojanized, meaning there was a backdoor injected into it, and then Solar Winds pushed that file out to all of their clients. So that resulted in a huge breach, and there was a company called FireEye, not to be confused with CyberEye. They're an actual, they're a really large cybersecurity company. And because they were using the SolarWinds suite, their network was compromised by this Russian backdoor. So now the Russians were on their network. And because they're a spectacular company, they were able to discover it after a time. But you know, we've been finding in this in the succeeding months that now NASA was a part of that breach. Uh, the U.S. Treasury Department was a part of that breach. It's just, it's getting worse and worse. So how did that happen? It happened because the companies were not using a concept that we call application whitelisting. And uh, essentially what application whitelisting is. Um, I have two dogs. Let me tell you the story real quick, Howard. I have two dogs. I have an old white dog. And when somebody knocks on the door, her name's Daisy. When somebody knocks on the door, Daisy goes crazy, runs to the door, flops over on her side and waits for a tummy rub, right? To Daisy, everybody's a friend. Um, your computer today is a Daisy. Everybody's a friend. I don't care if you have antivirus, firewalls, all that other good stuff. Your Windows computer's a Daisy. Well, last year, my wife bought another dog, a little black dog. His name's Chase. Well. When somebody knocks on the door and Daisy's on her side waiting for a tummy rub, Chase is there barking and growling because to Chase, nobody's a friend. Everybody's an enemy. So the concept of application whitelisting is you have a known good list or a list of known good software and only that software can run. That's how Chase operates. Daisy is a known bad list. And to Daisy, the bad software is not allowed to run, but the problem with Daisy is there's no there's no bad on her list. Everybody's <laughs> afraid. That's how antivirus works. Antivirus has a known bad list. And if you get a file on the computer, even if it's a bad file, if it's not on the list of the antivirus known bad list, that file will be allowed to run. Yeah. So what we use at CyberEye <clears throat> is this known good list. What we do is we, we monitor the computer for a couple of weeks, we see what's running, we create policies for everything that's running, and then when we flip your computer to secure mode, nothing is allowed to run after that unless it's already on the good list. So what, what is that? It's a pretty mean? short list anyway. It's a short list. Like 10, I mean, 10 15? Yeah, I mean, and, and once we go to secure mode, if you get ransomware on that computer, it's not going to match a policy, and so therefore it's not going to run. I, I have some maze ransomware on my demo computer at home, and I've tried to run it, and it won't run. So 
so that's the concept. And honestly, eventually everybody's going to be there. But right now it's a brand new concept. Um, Cyber is using it. A few other companies are using it too. But I mean, um, we have kind of nailed down how to do it effectively yeah. and, and cost effectively. So Howard, to answer the, the question back to your brand new dentist starting her own, her own office, um, I suggest, I recommend that uh, an actual, you know, you have an IT firm to do the IT part of what she needs to do. And then you have a cybersecurity firm that knows cybersecurity and they work hand in hand. And they like peanut butter and jelly, peas and carrots, um, those guys. But uh, an IT guy on its own is is in the wild, wild west. He'd be hanging out with Doc Holliday uh, because all they want, all the IT guy wants to do is make sure everything works. He will do whatever it takes. He'll open that port for your free remoting into your computer from from work, right? So that's what they're about. Yeah. Um, so the, the IT person, their job is availability. Remember I was talking about availability and the CIA triad, the IT person, their, their sole, uh, their sole focus is availability. You, so you have a dentist and, and, and you go to your dentist every six months to get x-rays and cleanings and maybe a filling if you got a bad tooth, but, but what if you need an implant? Do you go to the general dentist for the implant or do you go to the oral surgeon, oh, yeah. right? You have specialties in dentistry. And in the IT world, we have specialties too, just like that. And cybersecurity is especially, you need to have your IT person for the day-to-day -day things like cleanings and x-rays, but then you also need to have a specialist like an oral surgeon uh, for, the, for the specialized tasks. Because yeah. Because the IT guy and the cybersecurity guy are at, at, at ends, opposite ends of the spectrum. The cyber guy is going to say, we want to protect our client's data. And, and the IT guy says, whatever makes it work. Um, so there's, there's got to be that, that balance. It's all risk management right. in the end. Right. There's a it's got to work. There was a dental firm in town here in Sierra Vista back in December, and they were hit with ransomware. And when we investigated, they, they weren't a cyber eye client, by the way, just let me make that clear to begin with. They weren't <laughs> a cyber eye client when they were hit with ransomware. And it turns out what happened was back when COVID started, suddenly um, dentists, um, their, some of their staff had to be able to work from home. You probably in, encountered that. Um, so, so then the dentist went to the IT person and said, hey, I need you to figure out a way so that my business manager can work from home. And what they did, the, the cheapest and the fastest solution was to open a hole in the firewall. And then the person could launch remote desktop from home and then remote into their computer at work. Well, that was the worst thing to do. It was the fastest and it was the cheapest, but it was the worst thing. And what we found was that... Um, the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans were taking advantage of that open hole in the firewall and punching through into the network and dropping ransomware inside. And that's what happened at the dentist office. There was another office in town, a medical office that, that had the exact same situation uh, about, about a month ago. Except it cost them twice as much because Bit Bitcoin doubled. Yeah. So and, that was $500,000. And usually the ransomware lately that, that we've been with, that we know about is nine or 10 Bitcoin. So back in December, it was only $190,000. Uh, but in, by the end of January, it was almost $400,000 for that right. second comp uh, company. Right. So, so um, I don't want to derail this conversation, but I have to ask. Um, I know I'm old. I turned 59 this year. I, I get it. Uh, my four boys are now independent, and they've made six dependents on them. But... <laughs> I'm old school, man. I I, I think this. Um, um, I think Bitcoin is, is a joke. I mean, number one, a thousand of them have gone out of business. Number two, uh, this decentralized thing um, that's so decentralized. It's um, all the experts say, yeah, it's coming out of Russia, China, North Korea. Uh, number three, um, you know, when I I love history, and by the way, you uh, U of A. 
um, has one of the greatest historians ever, Noam Chomsky's down there. And uh, do you, have you ever met Noam down there at U of A? I have not. I have not. Um, um, and, I, and I know a lot of people agree or disagree with this politics, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about historical information. I'll give you an example. Like in America, everybody uh, can't stand Karl Marx. Okay, well, I'm sure Karl Marx's mom liked him. And then I, I always like to say, well, can you – my, my, my first sign of whether or not you're intelligent or not is if you're saying, oh, you have to get the red one and not the blue. I would say, okay, now stop. Now sell me the blue one with the same intensity. And they, they can't say anything about it. Well, Karl Marx, as much as his economics didn't work out, um, there was about a 25-year period where he was the only one writing down about the economics of his region. So for 25 years, if there wasn't Karl Marx, there would just be a blank data set. Uh, it's, it's like when people say, well, crime isn't related to poverty because there was no increase in crime during the Great Depression. Uh, yeah, there weren't any record taking either. Okay. I mean, it was a dust bowl, you know, um, but, um, but the, um, gosh, I'm on so many tangents over. I forgot where I was even going with this. Uh, Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin. A bit, Bitcoin believe. is the, the, the thing I learned from 5,000 years of history is you need, you want transparency on everybody. You don't want it opaque. And number two, you want checks and balance competition. Well, the first rule of, of um, Bitcoin is it's not transparent. It's 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 completely opaque. Oh yeah, that sounds like the greatest idea I've ever seen. Let's have an international opaque financial system. I mean, I mean, I know I'm old, but how young are you? I mean, if you ask me that, if you if you're trying to sell me that in grammar school, I want to I want to have lunch with you and have a conversation. But if you're still thinking that in your 30s, I mean, I mean, what what are your thoughts? Bitcoin is that going to replace the Federal Reserve someday? Uh, well, I have a lot of opinion on this, but number <laughs> one, the the reason why Bitcoin is used in ransomware is because it's anonymous, and that's why the the crime is spreading. There's so much crime going on. Uh, just Dan's opinion, and I don't speak for CyberEye uh, <laughs> <laughs> on this one, but uh, because of the uh, anonymity, I think the governments, when they get their own cryptocurrency moving around, because they're behind the times, right? So once they catch up to Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these other ones, uh, they're going to outlaw these other ones, and they're going to they're going to push hard to, to stop them. And, and, you know, my son will tell me, how are you going to stop them? You know, it's, it's the underworld, right? But, but you can, you can, right now they're starting to open up Bitcoin to your American Express card. Um, and, and I think within a few years, they're not, right? You're not, they're going to replace that Bitcoin on your American Express with the, the U.S. monetary digital currency. Well, That's I went to uh, I went to Creighton in Omaha, and I was I took freshman business one hundred and one in nineteen eighty, and Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger were born in Omaha, and, and I never got to meet Charlie, but Warren came over and talked to her class. But Charlie just said yesterday that um when, when um about um the brokerage houses now having Bitcoin uh, digital currency accounts and these other things, uh, he said, well, the brokerage houses would sell shit if shit was for, but if people were buying shit. He said they'd be the first ones to sell shit. That's what they do. They sell stuff. And if you want to buy a bunch of shit, they'll sell it. But he, he thinks it's absurd. But he's 92. So now I'm sitting there thinking, I, I don't want to turn into my grandpa and be that old crotchety <laughs> fart on the couch, you know, that doesn't like anything new. But it just makes zero sense of where I would want to have my money. But but I want to hold your feet to the fire. Yes or no. Then you can uh, answer the yes or no and then um, pontificate. Ransomware insurance, yes or no? Yes. Definitely yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely, Definitely yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to know why, or just you just wanted to yes or no? <laughs> no, no. I mean, yeah. I was going to buy some today with my Bitcoin, but I didn't know if I should. <laughs> um, but well, but, it's good. So what's what's involved, right? And and it's sort of funny uh, because I got into insurance after uh, joining CyberEye. I said we need to we need to find out you know, protect our clients the whole way. And so if, if for whatever reason, somebody actually has physical access and gets to your computer or, or your user training didn't work on that one new employee, 
and somehow you got ransomware. Well, what's the cost of ransomware? So besides that Bitcoin, that could be between two hundred and five hundred thousand dollars, depending on the how Bitcoin's going that week. You also have lost revenue. You also have to do uh, uh, notification because you're in the dent, uh, healthcare industry. You have HIPAA, so now you have to do uh, breach notification. You have to do identity monitoring. Uh, you have to do well. I tell you, it's best if you do forensic investigation of it. And I'll we'll stop right there because Tom has a, a story. Go ahead about that story about that crazy company. Oh, the, yeah, this was a ransomware attack just a couple months back. It was a, it was a large organization, but um, they cleaned up. Well, they kind of cleaned up. They paid the Bitcoin. They got the pass the pass phrases and 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 decrypted all the files, um, but they didn't do any forensics. They didn't find out how the ransomware got in. And a week later, they were hit again. Same ransomware by the same criminal, and they and they didn't get what's that called? Frequent flyer. Yeah, or, they did. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You don't get a discount. discount. Yeah. You don't get a discount for doing it twice. Yeah, but they love repeat customers. Those guys. So, right. so there are a lot of costs involved, and and you can't control everything. So it's all risk risk management, right? So sometimes it's risk transference, and the insurance is transferring that risk to somebody else. Now, when I talk about insurance, it's sort of funny because I I we did I did an article on on the insurance, uh, and what I found <laughs> was no two insurance companies are alike in their their cyber insurance. So getting getting one from Allstate and getting one from Nationwide, they're going to be totally different. So I have a few things that that I think for dentists are important, right? So dentists, you need to have breach insurance. You need to have notification, coaching, forensics, uh, identity monitoring, things like that, right? So, uh, and you need to have the liability that goes against it. You also need to have a good amount of ransomware. So a lot of, a lot of companies will have uh, data, they'll have data restoration, and they'll, they'll give you that with the business owner policy. But that's really not overly helpful if you're you're having a, a ransomware attack. And some of them, some of the insurance policies that I've seen only go up to like 25 grand for uh, the ransomware. And I'm thinking nowadays, you know, five years ago that was fine, but nowadays, you know, at at full, it should be the full amount. Your limit is what you should get get up to. So you really got to look for that that insurance policy that's, that's specific for cybersecurity insurance. I would not recommend, you know, oh, you got data coverage uh, in your business owner policies. Well, you also need to have a, a monoline, what they call one line policy for cybersecurity insurance. And it has to, it has to cover you. It has to, and, and the other thing a lot of them won't cover is the, the social engineering. I think that's a big deal. I recommend that to everybody I talk to because what's coming on now, and we and, and <laughs> we've had it twice, uh, where where all of a sudden I get a an email from the boss, and and <laughs> it looks like it's from the boss. Yeah, it says, "Oh, here you go, Tom Jukes. Here you go. Hey, I'm in a meeting, so just just don't just email me. I need you to pick up some gift cards, you know." And then I look up and I. You say urgent. Why don't I just text you? Uh, and I noticed that it's not Tom's email; it's Tom's name at the top. But it's it's random guy hacker at gmail dot com, and that's that's something you have to really watch out for. And and it happened locally. It happened at least three times this week. Not from CyberEye though. It wasn't cyber. Yeah, it wasn't okay, cyber, you, you, but three companies that we know ha got that attack. So if you don't have the training, then you could fall for it. Yeah. So you're talking about, um, you, you said a couple of different types of insurance. You said ransomware insurance. You said breachability insurance. Is is there one word that cyber insurance? Yeah, Cy cyber cybersecurity, insurance. Yeah, cybersecurity insurance. And uh, but like I said, depending on what broker you have, sometimes it's three different policies to get everything I described sometimes it's in one. 
Um, so so cybersecurity get... um, usually uh, covers three different policies, and those are ransomware and what else? Well, they they it, at, like I said, every company has their own way of doing it. So you have to really watch, but you have to make sure you have breach protection. So breach protection gives you coaching, forensics, investigation, identity monitoring, uh, and uh, breach notification. Those those are the big ones. Right. So breach protection, identity monitoring, and ransomware insurance. Is that what you said? Okay. Breach protection includes all those things I I just talked about. Okay, so breach so, for, breach protection includes identity monitoring. Yep. Monitoring and and uh, what breach notification, you know, and uh call center and expenses forensic investigation, incident response, you know, they'll pay for it. So the, the kind of insurance you want, so that's breach protection. Ransomware is actually when they pay for the ransomware. And, that, and then you want to make sure you have social engineering covered as well. Social engineering, because a lot of times they'll come in and most of the time it'll be a click of, somebody clicks a link that's, that's uh Oh, malicious email. or or on a website yeah yeah can you do that because um one of the um funny well first of all on the computer backup I, you know i like to tell you where i messed up i don't want to be making these kids think that i think i don't mess up but um when i opened up my dental office here in phoenix in 87 the computer guy who was selling me uh, my practice management software which was soft Hint, and um, I was getting the um, Intel 286, and he told me, Howard, they just came out with the 386, and if you pay more <laughs> money and you get the 386, you'll never have to buy another computer <laughs> the rest of your life. And uh, they, yeah, that thing lasts about a year. Then it was like the Pentium. Um, but, um, and, but anyway, I did my own backups um, because I'm just that smart. And then when it crashed... I was backing it to the D drive and I was supposed to be backing it to the C drive <laughs> and there was a donut nothing backup. <laughs> so I'm telling you guys, I've been telling you forever, please stay in your lane. And there seems to be a problem with dentists, lawyers, physicians, sorry, <laughs> but professors where they just think, well, I've always been the smartest guy in the room. I, I, I can, I don't, I can do everything. And then they have something like a leak on the roof and they find out they signed a triple net um, lease. So they have to repair the roof that blows their mind. Then they find out that they're in a 10,000 square foot center and the yoga lady next door that only has a mat on the floor, isn't going to pay for it. She just rolls up her mat and leaves and doesn't care. And then on the other side, it was a yoga shop that was been losing money for four months. So she's like, well, this is the last draw I'm leaving. And so the next thing this dentist realizes in 2000 square foot that he has to repair the entire 10,000 square foot roof. Or, or, or go out of business. And his lawyer said, well, who the hell read this 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 lease? And he goes, uh, uh, I did. I was a valedictorian at my dental school. No one cares. <laughs> You're good with teeth. You don't know shit about leases. You don't know anything about cybersecurity. Dentists, physicians, lawyers, professors, they, they're, you know, if you were always the smartest kid in the class, you think you know everything and you only know everything about this one little space called dentistry. And I wish it graduate from dental school. The, the dean should say, congratulations, you're a doctor of dental surgery and you don't know shit about anything else. <laughs> and, you know, stay humble, stay in your own lane. So I know what my dentists are thinking. You know, um, Socrates said that we had two emotions, uh, greed and fear, but uh, Darwin said it was really predator or prey. Everything looks to you like something you can eat as a resource or something that's going to eat you. And so money gets their attention. And um, so if someone breaks into me and they um, breach my computer and all this kind of stuff, what's the most this could cost me? Oh, 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 seven figures. Yeah. Seven figures. So you're talking divorce money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is. Honest, honestly, a lot of practices just go out of business. Really? Yeah. Yeah. 
because you, you're talking, I mean, just that other, the ransomware the other day, that if they paid it, it was $400,000 just for the ransomware. Now they were out of business. They haven't been able to bill yet. Yeah. So yeah, they've been, they've been they, practicing for a month without being, they've able to had to actually it. stop business for a while. But then besides all that, you got people want to, uh, people that want to sue you because now all their information is out. Right. So I, I did an article on Primera health, uh, health insurance and Primera was the, had the second largest, uh, regulation fine in history. Um, and, uh, the fine was the cheapest thing they had, $1.5 million or something like that. But then they got sued by uh, one of those group lawsuits for $50 million. So you have to have your liability set as well, but you also have, you know, the coaching fees and whatnot. So, and uh, the brief, the OC, um, the Office of Civil Rights will, uh, require you if they they know you have a breach and then they find out that you didn't actually do your due diligence they're going to be on top of you making give you making you pay for them to watch you yeah they'll, they'll put That's, somebody in your office as a, a compliance officer and you'll have to pay their you'll have to pay their yeah um, so you know. it could it could it gets up fast I okay mean, I, I, wanna, here, I need to go back a little bit um when um on the cybersecurity insurance, is there like a, a big household no-brainer name that my homies could feel safe buying it through or, you know? Cyberite? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, you sell that? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. So I'm an insurance agent as well. Like I said, I got into insurance to, to get there. And uh, I, I did the research as an insurance agent. And there, there are several that are good, but the one that I like best is cowbell that I'm, I'm don't, selling. Don't right. laugh, don't is laugh. What? Cow cow we need more cowbell. For real. <laughs> is it really called cowbell? Yeah, it's it's a brand, relatively new, it's like two years old company, and they're actually using the technology to do the underwriting. So I, it, they, they pull your Dun and Bradstreet, so I don't have to ask you 50 million questions before it happens. And then they start ping, um, what term do I use? They start checking your network to see how secure your network is. And depending on that, then they, and, and what industry and what your threat factors are. Okay, uh, and, but, and, then, and then there's another thing you were talking about I didn't quite understand. Um, you said, so you recommend Cowbell um, Cybersecurity yeah. in in yep. Insurance, and the rep you recommend there is Will Farrell. And um, <laughs> so the cybersecurity insurance, uh, <laughs> these include policies covering ransomware insurance, breach protection, brief, breach notification, identity monitoring. But I, I didn't understand what the forensics and social engineering was. All right. So two totally different things. So the social engineering part, if you get tricked into wiring somebody $100,000, and if, if it's tricked, then you're covered. Because that somebody social engineer, they tricked you. Oh, okay. They gave you a con job to convince you that, you know, convince me that Tom was sending me an email and I had to wire the funds. It's happened. It's right. happened right here in Sierra Vista. It's a wire transfer a lot. fraud. Wire yeah. what? Wire transfer fraud. Yeah. Uh, social engineering protection wire. And then what was the forensics? And now forensic is what Tom was talking about with that that, that company that got hit twice in a row. What what you have to do is you have to, it's a computer investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have oh. to you have, you have to comb comb through all the assets and find all the bad stuff and then get rid of it. That's basically okay. It. Yeah, okay, so, got that. And, and then, then um, can, and then the um, I always I know my homies, man. They they want to talk money. If I was going to be a full client uh, with cyberiaw.com, cyberi always watching dot com, uh, cyberi. What what is this? What, what would this cost the average dentist in Sierra Vista? So that that is a fantastic question, and we have to frame it first like this: um, If you it, the probability that that your that your homies are going to get hit within the next ten years is nearly a hundred percent. It's easily easily ninety nine point nine nine percent chance um, because ransomware is really easy to use, and all the big criminal organizations are on board. And so it's just law of probability, right? 
Um, so you're going to get hit. And what's it going to cost you? Could be, you know, you said, what's the most it's going to cost? Seven figures. You, I mean, just to make the numbers easy, we could say $500,000 is going to be the cost of your breach within the next 10 years. And then you, you know, average 50, that 50,000 a year. So 500,000. Yeah. So then, so what year. you're saying is that dentists should actually buy divorce insurance because that hit <laughs> is a million dollars. So would you buy two divorce policies before you bought uh, yeah. cowbell.insure? Oh, no, no. We would buy CyberEye. So, so that was to kind of frame everything into perspective. So $50,000 divided by 12 gives four you four grand a month. Four grand a month. So as long as you're paying less than four grand a month, which is probably tax deductible, whereas you know paying Bitcoin might not be tax deductible. You know you're gonna you're gonna be ahead of the game. However, it's way better than that. So CyberEye has four components. We have the technical side, which which locks up those files. Remember the the two dogs. It's turning your computer from Daisy to Chase. It's <laughs> teaching your users what bad emails look like, so they stop clicking on them. It's Offsite backups to take care of disasters, right? And then it's cyber insurance. And when it's and the insurance will be separate. Yeah, the insurance is separate because because it depends on the company. So right? you don't sell the insurance, you outsource that to Cowbell Cyber Security no, Insurance. No, we actually I work uh through Stickler Web Insurance. So, so the, just contact Dan. Yeah, contact me because I work through Stickler Web uh to do the Cowbell insurance. Right. So, so those four things together, I mean, if you exclude the insurance, because that's a separate thing, but, but a, a small practice with maybe 10, device. 10 devices, you're looking at less than $600 a month. I mean, that $600 a month is on the high end. Okay, but again, I know my homies. I mean, I've lectured in a thousand cities I, my first lecture was August 4th, 1990. I lectured 32 to 64 times a year. It took a damn pandemic. By the way, I just want to say um, I've been getting uh, crazy amounts of um, emails at Howard at Dentaltown.com say, hey, everybody's getting vaccinated. We're firing back up the conventions, and we want you to speak now. It took a damn pandemic to get me off the road. Um, I, it was hard to explain to my four children, but I can't explain it to my grandchildren. They're like, you're going out of town. No, I'm, I'm done. I, I can I can talk to far more people. I will I'll, I'll, I'll speak at your convention like this. But I'm not going to get in a damn airplane and fly to your city because uh, it doesn't make any sense. But I know my homies, and I know what a lot of them are going to say. They go, "Yeah, but I have I have firewalls. I have antivirus protection. Um, it's on my Microsoft. It pops up in the lower right hand corner. And says you have a firewall. You have anti. You have you. you I'm protected um, by just the regular stuff on his computer. What would you say to that guy? Well, it's kind of like this. Um, have you ever gone on a picnic and you stop at uh, at Kentucky Fried Chicken because you got to get the bucket of chicken and you get a whole bunch of uh, sodas as well and then you're sitting at the park and it's all sunny and there are bees flying around and and a bee flies right into the straw of your soda and you're not paying attention because you're talking to your your neighbor and you go to take a drink of your soda and you suck the bee right into your mouth you know that maybe that's never happened to you but it's happened to people <laughs> so. The cup of soda is the internet. The soda inside's the internet. And the lid that you put on top of the cup, you, you put the cup, the, the lid on the cup to keep the dirt out and to keep the bees out. But the bee finds the straw that goes through the lid. Imagine the soda inside is the internet. The lid on the top is a firewall and antivirus. And the straw that pokes right through the firewall and antivirus is your browser. So every firewall has a big gaping hole in it for a browser and for email. Mm -hmm. And that's how ransomware gets in. That's how malware gets in, comes right into an email. Yeah. So if you don't use email or browse the web, you're safe. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah, um, a lot. Uh, here's another. Here's another thing. Uh, I've already been told this on person. I've already seen it. A post on Dental Town. They go, um, if I say so, because I've asked a lot of my friends, do you do you have cybersecurity insurance? 
And uh, actually, that's a joke. I don't have any friends, but uh, they're 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 pretend <laughs> friends. And they and you know what they you know what they say to me? They say, "Well, um, I I don't know. I I assume my IT guy is doing all that. I mean, I I, I got a guy. I got an IT guy. Uh, anything wrong with my computer network? The, the the office manager calls him. He comes out. I I got a guy. Is that guy doing all the cybersecurity? Is 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 all you know, I mean, what would you what, what do you think the chances his IT guy is on top of it? Uh, well, I met with a, a client just last week, a new client, and when I was talking about the, the 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 cup with the lid and the straw and the firewall and the antivirus, um, and I mentioned one of the most popular ways this last year that ransomware gets in, which is through that the hole in the firewall so that the office manager can work from home. As soon as I mentioned that, he said well, wait a minute, that's how that's how my IT guy set us up, just like that. Is that the wrong way? And I said, yeah, that's absolutely the wrong way. And he said, why didn't my IT guy know about that? Well, it's because the IT guy is like the family doctor or the general dentist. Security, like Dan said, is on the opposite side of the spectrum. And it's a specialty. And the IT people, they know a little bit about security but they don't read the cyber threat intelligence reports every day like I do. They don't find out the the the, the newest, the du jour, the you know how, how attackers are getting in this week. They just don't have time. They don't have the bandwidth to do that. Just like general general dentistry, you're into cleaning teeth and doing all those day to day things, but you're not into doing implants and braces and all the specialty things. So no, the IT guy, could he, could she? Sure, they could, if they spent the time to do the research like I do, but they just don't have the time. It's more of a unicorn. It, <laughs> it's a unicorn. Yeah, that's the unicorn, yeah. the, the IT guy that loves cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, the anomaly. Does that make sense, Howard? <laughs> yeah, it, it totally makes sense. I mean, again, I mean, like my, you know, I work at Lifetime. One guy is an ophthalmologist. One guy is an optometrist, only does glasses. One guy only does glaucoma on diabetics. One guy only does retinas. I mean, they, I mean, we're talking about an eyeball, one <laughs> little eyeball, and it's in dentistry. When um, and when I got out of school, there was eight specialties. Now there's twelve, and I I can't compete with those other new specialties. I mean, they're just too intense. Um, I want to I want to um um. I know Dennis and you say, do you have any questions? And they say, no. And you say, okay, well, let's take a 10 minute break. Then they all run up to you with this, with their little personal individual question. And they're all the same. They're just, it's a weird phenomena. They couldn't ask the class. So 10 guys come up and ask the same question. Rule number one, um, just what do I do if I've been hacked? What what should be the first thing I do? Call your insurance company. Uh Uh-huh. If you have cyber insurance, uh, the insurance company will 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 give you a coach. They will step you through it. They'll they'll send an incident handler over there if you have good cyber insurance. That would be a great poll on Dental Town. Should I just say, do you currently have um what would you call it? Cybersecurity insurance? Oh, yeah. Yep. Do you have cybersecurity? And, and is cybersecurity one word or two? It's one. It's one. Okay, sort of and, a, and 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 I'll I'll that's what I love about dental time because so many dentists say, well, you know, most dentists blah 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 blah, and I'll say, really, can I see the the poll or the the date on that? And it's like uh, I just pulled that out of my ass, and it's like, oh, okay, um, you know, um, so um, so what I'm, but I'm just asking you guys to guess, um, would that be um, my gosh, so that would be um. It wouldn't be computer hardware, computer maintenance, computer equipment, practice management software. It'd be it's, it's, it's a software. Separate, it could be a separate line item. Cyber security. But would, would it be a, would it be under um, software or mobile devices and applications of those of those no. choices? What would it no, be? No, it, it's a it's a completely different animal. Cybersecurity is its own thing. It's not a software thing. It's not a hardware. Well, yes, it is software. It is hardware. It is people. It's insurance. It's it's the whole thing. So I mean, honestly. Are you talking about the groups on Dental Town? Yeah. It, so, so Town I should have a so, cybersecurity group. It it might go to uh, run in an office, business operations. Do you have something like yeah, that? Business be. operations. 
Because it's all your risk management all is all business operations concerns. So how do you run the would, office? Would you just call that yeah. whole forum cybersecurity? Yeah. But what is your guess? I know you don't have data, but if you had to make an educated guess, what percent of the dentists listening to you right now do you think already have a cybersecurity insurance and which ones are running naked? Oh, 40%. Yeah, I was going to say 30, but Dan's more optimistic than I am. 40% already have the cybersecurity insurance? That's my guess. I'm going to say 30, wow. though. I'm actually surprised. You know, originally, before I started asking, I, I didn't think, I thought it was around 10. But once I started asking, a lot more people had it than I thought. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised. It was well, happily. Well, well, hang on a second. There, you might have dentists that think they have cybersecurity insurance yeah. when they don't. Or they may have like a cybersecurity rider Right. on their insurance that's insufficient so yeah a lot of times it'll be that insurance setting is included in your business owner policy that that data uh coverage that that a lot of policies give you for free uh, that's not going to cut it if you yeah. get ransom so, so i i have a i have a client who's a lawyer and i i every time i ask him a question about you know is this going to protect me in court his response is wait a minute we don't want to find out. <laughs> we want to do everything we can to keep it so you don't have to find out if this will hold up in court. So let's be honest and let's do all the good things first, right? So you so so if you if you oh, get God. a breach, if you get a breach, then absolutely you got to call your insurance agent. But the, the, the key is we want to prevent the breach. Yep. And that's why CyberEye, because right. this is the only thing I've ever seen that comes near 100% secure yeah nothing and then, else like it and that would be the second person you call your cyber security company well yeah ideally if you have one ideally your cyber professional is going to know about it before you do unless you get hit with ransomware then i mean that's the one ransomware is the only alert we get from the user first because the user sees the sees the um ransom note pop up on the screen right and then the user calls it hey what does this thing mean and IT then throws up their hands, you know. Well, so should that form be cybersecurity ransomware or, or not? No, just cybersecurity. Just cybersecurity. Okay. And then one thing, let me, uh, Tom hit a note. What do you do? All right. First thing you do is you unplug from the network. You do not turn off your computer. Do not turn off, please. I saw that on a forum. I'm like, oh my yeah, goodness. Don't, don't turn Do it not, off. Because all your forensic evidence goes down the toilet. It's, it's in your random access memory. It's yeah. in your in your cache memory. That's right. There is a high probability that key you're about to pay $500,000 for is in memory and we can get it out. Yep. Wow. So do not turn off your computer. Just That's unlock right. it from the internet. Yeah. Yep. So turn off your Wi-Fi. Yeah. If you have okay. it, uh, Wi-Fi, which a, a dentist office sh should not have Wi-Fi, yeah. by the way. <laughs> right. But they do. Uh, they but do. they do. <laughs> so yeah, run in the back and unplug that wireless router. That'll shut down the whole network and it'll prevent the ransomware from spreading to the other computers. And, so, and it'll preserve the memory. I know we went over an hour and I'm so thankful you guys are on overtime, but I still have one other uh, subject. Um, a lot of, um, explain the connection between, um, and I know it's obvious, but someone, it might not be obvious. And a quarter of our listeners are still in dental kindergarten school. What is the connection between cybersecurity and HIPAA? HIPAA is, well, HIPAA is the, the health, health insurance portability protect protection. No, that's two P's and it's got a one P and two accountability, a. accountability act. act. That's what it is. So that was all about that was all about making sure that your insurance can, is easily transferable from one place to another. But there's the there's the security feature in it that that specifically talks about if that health information, the PHI, is inadvertently disclosed to to an entity that should not get it. That's when you have to do the breach notification and all that. So cybersecurity is the thing that prevents that from happening. Well, let me let that? me jump in. Uh, so what it is, cybersecurity is is in HIPAA. Cybersecurity is the due diligence that you have to do mm -hmm. 
Due diligence, I think, is the best word when you're well, talking about HIPAA because they don't. The HIPAA doesn't tell you how to do uh-huh. it. They just said protect it in a very vague it's, way. Yep. But if you're using industry best practices, you will pass that audit mm-hmm. without a doubt. Mm-hmm. If you say, oh, you know, oh, I do my yearly risk assessments. I I have uh, cyber protection on every device is being monitored and. And I close my firewalls, I use a VPN or something not, you know, and not an open RDP, a remote desktop port. Uh, so if you go there and the Office of Civil Rights investigates you, you'll pass that audit in a heartbeat because you could say, look, I did my HIPAA training. We do cybersecurity training every week. We, we do dark web monitoring. We do, uh, we do this endpoint monitoring and protection. So we don't do this, right? Uh, but cyber, HIPAA is not just cybersecurity, right? HIPAA means, all right, you have this, do you have the screen protectors on, on your screen? So people going by can't look at the, you know, look down and they, oh, what's, what's uh, Joe doing? What's he in for this time, you know? So that's, that's even even a breach. The mm-hmm. physical protection is important too. So it's it's the whole the whole gambit. But uh, the HIPAA's concern is, you, it's your job to protect that client data. It's his data, and then you you're responsible for it. And some of it, like say, I don't want to throw any dentists under a bus, but some of it is kind of dumb. Like there's you know they um, dentists that make the big bucks, they don't buy. Um, the the DVD or the movie, and they say, oh, that, there's these websites where you can download the Netflix movie for free and save money. And they used to do it with music. They you remember back in the day, and and a lot of uh, not the old guys. The old guys don't know how to do it. But a lot of these young millennials, they they tell me they don't pay for any of that stuff. They download movies from these sites and things like that. And I would just have to think that that could be a a huge boo boo. Yeah, it's ta- I call it table stakes. So if you're table a gambler, stakes. table stakes, right? If you're a gambler, you got to ante in. It's table stakes in order to start it. It's tables today, stakes to get regular insurance for your, it's table stakes to have workers comp. It's table stakes to, to have a, a lobby for your customers to sit in ahead of time, right? Cybersecurity is table stakes as well. Yeah, it's, you it's you got to think years. about it differently now, because in the last three years, the whole the whole crime syndicate for cyber has exploded. OK, so back. Uh, I swear I'll let you guys go as soon as I can. But I still got a few more questions. Should their emails be encrypted? I mean, like when I email my mom, should that be encrypted? I mean, all my emails are from my my uh, outlook and it's, you know, dental, all that. I mean, what, what do you think? Well, let me ask you a question, Howard. Are you, are you, is this personal or is this professional? So professional, are you sending, uh, is there any protected information, some health information you're talking about? I think all the dentist peanut butter and jelly. I mean, you email a patient and then the next email is to your mom and then the next one's to a patient. The next one's to your brother. Well, you know, oddly enough, HIPAA has said, as long as the patient is aware that these emails are not encrypted, and they agree to it, you can use unencrypted email. Uh, now, uh, is it a good a, idea? Is it a good idea? No, no. no. <laughs> Everybody should be using encrypted email all the time, period. And uh, and inter-office communications, in my opinion, should not be over email. It should be over something like Signal, some end-to-end encrypted messaging system. Yeah, Signal or Slack. That's I don't like Slack. Idea. I like Signal. Signal's my thing. Signal is yeah. better encryption. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, um, my gosh, uh, I could go on and on and on. Um, and last question. Uh, on this whole um, cybersecurity, you talked about the HIPAA connection. Is there an OSHA connection, the other big regulatory monster in dentistry? Mm, I don't think so. Please. I've never seen OSHA come up with cybersecurity. No. If, it, if, it, <laughs> if it's there, I haven't seen it. It's all HIPAA. All right. Well, yeah. my gosh, um, you're the uh, – um, thank you so much for coming on. This is a very timely, um, very timely uh, podcast. Um, this is a big problem. Um, the optimists, obviously the bald people are always the optimists. He says 40% of dentists have insurance. That man with all that weird shit on his head is saying it's only 30%. I don't care if it's 
That means half of you guys listening don't have it. And he just said it's a, probably a 99% chance it's going to happen to you in the next 10 years. And if the economy goes south, which in my lifetime, um, you know, Joseph Schumpner got a Nobel Prize in economics and business cycles. I mean, creative destructionism, um, you know, humans are making all the decisions. So usually it's two steps forward, one step back. And I'm not a doom and gloomer because I lived through, I graduated from high school in 1980. That's when, my God, 20% interest rates. I graduated dental school in 87. Black Monday was four months after I graduated. The Y2K bubble, the Lehman's Day bubble. We are so... So in a bubble, um, if you don't know that we're in a bubble, um, you should get a friend who has a PhD in economics. I mean, you could, you should be able to see this thing um, from, you know, from the spa- the space Hubble. I, I mean, the <laughs> Hubble's telescope. You, you know, I mean, th- we're in a massive bubble, and I imagine if the, the economy contracts and a lot of people get desperate, they're going to try to steal even harder. I mean, you know, the the one thing you always fear is someone who has nothing to lose. And I noticed that during these big economic contractions and people lose all their easy bread and butter, um, they, they're, they're probably going to be trying to switch and steal your credit cards. On that. Last question, last question, last question. How often should you change your passwords? Uh, uh, only when they when you can confirm that that password's been involved in a breach. So if you're not sure, if you're not sure, go to the this website. Have I been have pwned. I been pwned? Have I been pwned? P W N P W N E D. Have, have I been P W N E D? Have I been? It's pronounced pwned. P W N-E-D. And com. what's the name of the website? That, that's the whole website? That is the, the website. website. www. <laughs> have I been P-W-N-E-D? Yeah. 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 If you just go to Google and type that in, it's the first thing that will come up. You can put your email address in. It'll tell you if that email has ever been involved in a breach and that, and your passwords are now on the dark web. If, if, you're, if you come up there, um, then go change all your passwords. Again, don't reuse them anywhere. Yeah. But once you get a good, secure, strong... By long. secure, I mean long. long, right? It's floss, right? Make it long. Don't share it. It used to be it used to be the recommendation to change your passwords every 90 days. The National Institutes of Standards and Technology now say, don't change your passwords frequently. Should I just change my password to Kenny? So now I have all Kenny logins. <laughs> <laughs> you're so terrible. You're I so love those dad jokes. Yeah. Those are awesome. I'm going to use that one. Yeah. And, and use a password manager. Yeah, password manager is the way to go. Yep. And what is the password? Um, is that the website? Password manager? Uh, no, no, you can use about four Bitwarden. Different ones. Bitwarden is an open source free one that I like. Uh, which one, which one do you recommend? Just tell me. Bitwarden. Bitwarden. B-I-T-W-A-R-D-E-N. It's just yeah. because I like yeah. the open source stuff. Uh, um, last pass. Oh, last B-I-T-W-A-R-D-E-N? pass. B-I-T-W-A-R-D-E-N? Yes. Yes. All right. Yep. My and gosh. If we, and if you get our service, Howard, we do dark web monitoring as well. So we can, you know, every, you know, every time you pull it up, it'll it'll constantly search the dark web for your your domain. Uh, your domain name. Your so yeah. dentaltown.com. We could put it in there. And if anybody's in any one, so you just went to I have I been pawned and checked Howard's. Now you could check uh, through the service, you can check. Everybody's at dental time. Yeah, yeah. Cyber Eye does that. Yeah. What you yeah. just saw and how I've been pwned, we do that for every email in your organization. All the time. Been and then so then I go to Bitwarden and I download the app on my phone and the computer. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then, and then how's that work? Yeah. You 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 download them, you you connect them, right? And so then when you go to a website where you have to put in a password, it will suggest one for you. And then once you put that password in or register at the website, it'll save it. Then every time you go back to that website, Bitwarden will populate it for you. So it makes strong passwords for you. The only password you have to remember, one password, one password you have to remember the one to Bitwarden. That's it. So make that one super long. Doesn't have to have numbers. Doesn't have to have special characters. Doesn't have to have capital letters. Just make a really long five or six unrelated words. Like, so you're saying I should put in Kenny Loggins' middle name? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, gentlemen, this has been just utterly amazing, and it's such an honor 
to have you guys on Dental Town. I mean, it's not every day you get the professor to come <laughs> on to Dental Town. And uh, but um, thanks for uh, um, my gosh, all that you do and all you come. So how do um, so the obvious question is um, how do how do they contact you if they got questions? They're listening to this and they got to call you and they got all these questions. How, how do they contact you guys? People, we're on Dental Town number one. Number two, just um, email Tom at cyberiaw.com. Gavin, last name at cyberiaw.com. So they can reach us via email or or just reach out to us on Dentaltown. We you can find us there too. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. And if there's ever some big story in the news or whatever, come back on the show and tell us. Absolutely, sure. All right. Thanks, Have Howard. A great day. Thanks, Howard.